Hey guys, welcome back. This is John Wynn from Immunology Class. Um, last time we learned about what monoclonal antibodies are and how they play an important role in medicine. In this video, I think uh, we should take a look at how monoclonal antibodies are actually made. The original method was created by Cesar Milstein and George Kohler in 1975, and they actually won the Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology and Medicine for their work. Um, since then, many variations to the method have been created, and the techniques will differ depending on the type of antibody that you're making. Uh, and these types can include murine, chimeric, humanized, and fully human uh, MAVs. In this video, however, uh, we will just examine the original method for murine monoclonal antibody production. Alright, so let's begin. First, we need to immunize an ML model, such as a mouse or a rabbit, with a specific antigen, uh, which can be a single protein or a carbohydrate. The mouse or rabbit is likely to have naive B cells that recognize the injective molecule due to somatic recombination and junctional diversity. Now, one thing I would like to mention is that these antigens are usually attached to adjuvants so as to boost immunogenicity of the antigen. Adjuvants may include aluminum salts, oils, and even bacterial components, such as lipoproteins, flagellins, and LPS, or lipopolysaccharides, which are recognized by TLR, which are toll-light receptors, uh, specifically number four, found commonly on macrophages. So these adjuvants can function to protect the antigen by prolonging the immune response. Um, they can also enhance the immune response by stimulating the release of cytokines. An example would be the inactive components of mycobacterium, which is also known as Freund's adjuvants, and it enhances the immune response by stimulating the release of TNF, or tumor necrosis factor, which facilitates the entry of neutrophils, NK cells, and other effector cells into the infected area. And upon recognition of the antigen and its adjuvant, these naive B cells would activate and be selected and propagated through the processes of clonal selection and clonal expansion. Next, the plasma B cells are extracted from the spleen and combined with myeloma cells. These myeloma cells are cancerous plasma cells that have lost the ability to synthesize an enzyme called hyposanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, or HGPRT. And this enzyme uses the amino acid hyposanthine to create guanine in the recycling pathway or salvage synthesis of nucleic acids. Um, this is a crucial pathway for cells that have lost the ability to synthesize nucleic acids through the de novo pathway. Normal B cells, however, will still retain this enzyme, HGPRT. Next, the plasma membranes of the B cells and the myeloma cells are fused together using polyethylene glycol, or PEG. Next, we select for hybridoma cells, which are B cells fused with myeloma cells using HAT medium, which stands for hyposanthine, aminopterin, and thymidine. Aminopterin blocks de novo synthesis of DGTP and DTTP, forcing cells to rely on the recycling pathways that depend on the enzyme HGPRT. Now, myelomas do not have this enzyme, so unfused myelomas, or myeloma-myeloma fusions, will die due to no DNA synthesis. B cells still retain this enzyme, so even though the de novo pathway is inhibited, they can still synthesize DNA. The hypoxanthine and the thymidine supplementation allow the production of DNA in these B cells. However, unfused plasma B cells and B cell B cell fusions will die because of their inherent nature. They lack the telomerase to propagate indefinitely, like myeloma cells. Therefore, only B cell myeloma fusions or hybridomas will survive the selection via HAT medium. They use hypoxanthine to make GTP. Uh, due to the B cell contribution, and they can survive in tissue culture indefinitely due to the myeloma contribution. The resulting hybridomas collected do not all produce monoclonal antibodies, so we must screen for the hybridoma cells that are producing antibodies. Then we need to dilute the sample to an extent that only one cell clone occupies one well in a microwell plate. Now, we have monoclonal antibodies, but not necessarily for the target antigen. Therefore, we need to rescreen using the antigen to determine a suitable cell line. And after selection, we need to expand our cell line, 
or we need to grow our hybridomas, and we can do this in one of two ways. Um, we can do this in vivo by injecting the hybridomas back into our animal models, back into the mice and rabbits, or we're going to do this in vitro uh, by growing them in fetal bovine serum to reduce the antiserum. What's interesting to note is that hybridomal growth in mice will tend to yield other artifacts such as murine proteins. In vitro growth, however, in fetal bovine serum can yield less impurities, and this is just something to consider uh, during the monoclonal antibody production. And lastly, we purify our sample by high performance or high pressure liquid chromatography, which separates the monoclonal antibodies from other impurities, thus giving us our desired monoclonal antibody that recognizes our target antigen. And this concludes our overview of monoclonal antibody production, also known as hybridoma technology. I hope you found this information to be useful. For more information, please check out these websites in the description below. Next time, we'll talk more about the therapeutic applications of monoclonal antibodies. Thanks.